How's everyone doing today? All right, fantastic. Hopefully everyone in the chat is doing good today. And I for one am oof, just so glad that I have this illustration finally done. For the last few weeks, I've just been working on it on my own spare time after work. And even usually in the morning before work, I don't do it much personal work because I have this issue where if I start something and let's just say that the personal piece doesn't go well then I'll be carrying that emotional baggage me to the office and if the work at the studio is also not doing so well then I end up feeling rather crummy <laughs> for the rest of the day so I made it a point for a while not to do any personal work but considering that this illustration has stretched on for a couple of weeks. I needed all the extra time that I can get. <laughs> and Latte Milky says, let me move to your version of Alberta, Joe. Want to have a vacation there too? Well, you're more than welcome to stay there, Winnie. And for those of you that don't know what uh, she's talking about, Alberta is the illustration of the town that I have here up on the screen. And for the previous Design Jam episodes, Ken and I have taken some designs of cities from a game called Ragnarok Online, which is an MMORPG that was released, I think, in the early 2000s. And it's, I, although I don't play that many games, it's one of my favorite games of all time and has been a big influence in terms of the kind of subject matter I love to draw and also the direction of art that I've, I've decided to go forward with. So it has a really nice mix of fantasy and almost like Korean, Korean, uh, Korean style illustrations. And what I really loved about it was just the world building. And I decided to choose the port town of Alberta, which you can see on the screen right here. And for today's episode, I will be going through the thought process and showing you guys a time lapse of this particular illustration uh, from the early rough sketch stages up to the finished stage and just comment, comment, doing commentary over it. So if you guys have any questions or want to chat about certain parts of the illustration or if if you have any questions with the techniques or whatever that I'm doing please feel free to ask uh, while I'm doing the commentary so this is the finished result uh, and I can show you guys actually for those of you that have not been here for a previous few episodes I think it'll be a good idea to start off by showing you with the original screenshots from the game itself so this is actually how the area looks like inside the game and what made Ragnarok online unique was the fact that it used primitive 3d with some 2d sprites in it which helped it to age quite well. And it's actually one of those games that I've been coming back to over the years. So the last time that I played, I think was just a few years ago, actually. And considering this game was released in the early 2000s, and I actually managed to be, to play during the early days as well. It still just feels as fresh and inspiring as the day that I played it. So yeah, these are 2D sprites in a 3D background. And this is the town of Alberta. So as you can see, it's a port city. And it's actually based off of a real life location, which is I think Santorini in Greece. And this is the original concept that I suppose the artists have done for this area. And hey Hebron, good to see you in the chat today, man. And yeah, glad to have you finally here. And right now I'm just going over some of the initial references that I started off with. And 
when I was starting off with this illustration, I really wanted to capture the liveliness of this area because this is supposed to be a port town where a lot of people, uh, players can come to and travel to different areas and it's supposedly a merchant town as well or a lot of commerce is done so I wanted to make it feel that it was rich as well and full of life too and I really wanted to capture that summery vibe that's also present in a lot of the coastal towns that you see. So that's where I actually started off with is that I decided to look at a lot of references of coastal towns and areas. And one thing I've noticed amongst all of them is that they have quite a light and uh, quite a light color palette. So a lot of the materials, as you can see, is either quite vibrant or even quite bright in terms of the local values too. And I think that really contributes to the place feeding lively. Because if you can imagine if there was a lot of darker paint and especially desaturated, then I think it would have you know, the opposite effect. And one thing that I've also noticed from the collection of a lot of these reference images is that there's a lot of foliage as well and palm trees too. And I think those are simple things that I can use to actually hint at liveliness in a place, which is yeah, through the presence of nature and alongside of it as well and since it's a port town I think it would be quite logical to find reference images of the docks of docks and also certain ships that would populate those areas too and looked at some colonial architecture but I don't think that I ended up using many of these reference images and what I usually like to do before I start an image or during the process is that I really like the idea of looking at other artists not necessarily to copy but just to find images that have the feel or the finished result quite close to what I want in my image so I had a look at a lot of images for example from Overwatch that's something that I've been looking at a lot in terms of the level of finish. One thing I like is the stylized shapes, but at the same time, the physically based, physically based renders, which means that it, it's more accurate to how light would behave in real life and with all the materials. And of course, I've been looking at a lot of anime style illustrations as well because I, I think that a lot of them do a great job in capturing a high key lighting that makes it feel so inviting and warm as well. So I collected quite a few of them as you can see and I even tried to collect some images of traditional paintings as well. And in hindsight, I might have chosen a little bit too much so that made it a little bit confusing for me later on with establishing the art direction that I wanted, but I'll get to that later. And of course, some character reference images as well. So I took some concept art or character illustrations from the game itself to populate the final image with. So after starting all of this, um, I've actually done some of the preliminary sketches on the previous episodes of the podcast which we have not edited yet but we'll be getting around to that soon and posting it up so if you guys are interested you can watch that and of course you guys might have noticed that I'm the only one that's hosting the podcast today and that's because Ken has actually been out of town for the last few days so he's left me all alone to take care and host the podcast so as much as I miss him, I'm just going to do my best to fill in for the hole that he has left behind in the podcast and in our hearts, of course. So uh, after starting off with the reference images, I decided to do a few rough sketches. And instead of actually going back and showing those very early rough sketches, which I really struggled with, 
So if you guys know my portfolio, a lot of the stuff that I do is usually singular architecture. So when it came to the time of actually drawing, you know, sprawling city that's full of life, full of depth and full of layers, I found that I found myself feeling like a fish out of water. And it took me so long to actually come up with some sketches that I thought had potential and to also show that in front of people on a podcast, my mistakes and all of my struggles that was tough but i managed to finally come up with something that i was quite happy with and let's see if i have it here all right i actually do so give me a moment i've actually compiled a whole bunch of images together right now which i'll be creating a small gif later on too so this is actually the initial sketch that i finished off with and <laughs> One thing that I really wanted to capture is a, a grand overview of the whole area. I wanted the docks to be seen. I wanted some of the architecture, the designs of the architecture to be fully evident as well. Not something that's so suggested and far off in the background, but something that I suppose would give the players or people that are looking at this image a good idea of how the rest of the architecture in the background would be like hey Harrison good to have you on the stream man how are you doing um, I've actually haven't gone too far with the whole process and I'm just currently showing the early rough sketch that I started off started off with and without further ado guys I will actually show the time lapse and start the co doing some commentary over it let me just pull up the video player and i think this should be it so this is actually a little bit further back from the sketch the fin the finished rough sketch that i showed you guys and as you can see things are moving really really fast because altogether i think i had around like 20 or 30 hours of raw recorded footage <coughs> And that's also excluding some of the footage that I didn't record because sometimes I try to do a little bit of a scribble and I read and I think that oh it wouldn't be worth recording but as it turns out I ended up spending a whole hour on it and missed out on some key footage but yeah in any case this this thing that I really struggled with in the rough stage was first of all coming up with a pleasing composition and I tried to do my best to think of some pleasing ones in my mind but I seem to have neglected the key advice that I've given a lot of people which is you know have good reference and there was one key reference that I've seen um, let me actually pause the video for a while and I will show you the exact reference image that I used so the a reference image that I used was this one actually and I really like how you can see the architecture up close like I was saying before yet you're able to see beyond uh, beyond the horizon as well and also the lower areas and despite the reference image not having much details at the bottom I figured that that would be the perfect location for the docks or maybe uh, other architecture and parts of the city as well and the background could also have some of these larger mountain ranges in the back so in a way I was cobbling a lot of different reference images together so hopefully that gives you guys a little bit of an idea of what I look for in a reference image because I think it's easy to take it for granted when you tell other people oh find good reference images but what a good reference image is might be a little bit vague for some people but in any case uh, usually in my process as well I tend to separate things into layers so there's the mid-ground at uh, the foreground mid-ground and then background and why I do that is that it allows me to make changes much more easily rather than having to I guess make careful selections if I want to change things and as you can see shifting those palm trees and redrawing the background became a lot easier 
and I received a lot of feedback at this stage as well. And like I said, because I was not so settled on what I wanted, I kept on making a lot of these changes. And also, <laughs> another thing that I really struggled with was actually the fundamentals itself. So although I did a rough perspective, I did not carefully plot it out in this case. And because I did not plot out the perspective properly and calculate how things translate into perspective as they go further back, uh, as you can see, I'm, I'm now putting in the perspective lines um, because I figured that <laughs> if I really want to do it right, I should put in the time to do it the right way. And I'm just doing the refine line work pass. But I should have done this a lot easier. And even at this stage, I didn't really take the time to calculate some of the scale translations. So what I mean by that, let's just say if I want to move the building of the same size into the background, that's translating it back into perspective. And because I did not properly calculate it for the things in the background, things ended up being out of scale. And that would be a lot more apparent later on. And in hindsight, I think what I could have done was add in some scale references, such as even a stick figure, you know, in the foreground, in the background, and maybe in the sky, just to make sure that everything is correct and all the size relationships are all there before I do finished line work such as this. And Alexandria asks, how do you make the perspective line in Photoshop? I use a plugin called Perspective Tool and you can easily Google that up. And let me check actually if that's the exact name. Yes, it's called Perspective Tools and it is something that I did pay for actually. But I find that to be indispensable. But otherwise, I would typically draw it myself. And Latte Milky also asks, so in your early rough sketch, did you think of perspective? first during ideation and I do it's just that I do it very crudely and so what I mean by that is that I establish the horizon line and I do some rough perspective lines but I don't make it as accurate as the ones that I've just put in because when I do that I tend to find that it actually stifles the the flow and the liveliness of of the image and I tend to stick to the perspective grid a little bit too much and I try to like snap it to the points on the that the perspective lines intersect at so I usually add in afterwards and that's one of the things that I've really been trying to do is just keep that liveliness of the sketch but in this case <laughs> In trying to keep that liveliness, I think I sacrificed a little bit of accuracy for it. So even right now, as you can see, I'm still changing around the composition and the position of things because something didn't feel right. And so, like some of the problems, as, as you can see at the docks, there's a bunch of cranes on the foreground. And I tried to put some in the background, but one strange thing is that the crane in the background seemed to be above the horizon line, which would mean that it's a lot taller than um, the cranes in the foreground. So it's just things like that, and which could have been prevented just through taking my time with establishing the fundamentals, honestly. So yeah, at this stage, I'm just refining the line work uh, just to make sure that I have an idea of where all the elements will be before I go into the colors. I know that some people like to go straight into colors or just do quick value sketches when it comes to creating environments, but I'm not that comfortable with painting yet and any help that I can get. And in this case, line work is always a welcome addition for me. So right now I'm just adding in all the smaller details as well. Just trying to sell the believability of the place. 
and at this stage actually things are starting to feel a little bit better to for me which is and partially as well is that i've decided to just go forward with things i tend to have a bad habit of constantly changing things but the moment that i was able to tell myself that okay this is enough and i just need to move on it's usually when <laughs> progress starts to happen. Hey Taya, good to see you in the chat again. So, so do you also have that same problem then of just constantly making changes and just second guessing all of your decisions? Because I sure as hell do. And <laughs> even later on during the painting, you'll see even more big changes. So although this stage is where I should have breezed through I suppose and moved on to color stage much sooner oh, it ended up taking a huger chunk of my time than I expected and Taya says yes and it slows me down so much even with line art I race way too much <laughs> I do too oh trust me especially for bigger illustrations such as this and Yin Harry also says, a lot of really tiny items. So much detail in the drawing. That's crazy. Well, <laughs> I think it's one of those things that would really sell the scale. And like, it's, uh, because I did say earlier on, I was struggling a lot with creating a believable sense of scale and also space. And even though I could have addressed that later on in the painting stage, I'd like to have the philosophy of getting things done right and all of the foundations put in place as soon as I can so that I don't have much doubts moving forward. I mean, some people, like I said, have that confidence, but I'm certainly not one of those people that do. And at this stage, as you can see, I've started putting in the colors because I've told myself, okay, I gotta stop noodling on the lines and just move forward with the piece. And even with my coloring workflow, I'm, I've been quite stubborn in the way that I approach it. Instead of manually choosing the colors, I try and use a method that's a bit non-destructive. And you can say that that's maybe a product of working in a studio for a while and just waiting for that moment where the client says hang on what you're doing now isn't quite what we want so we need to make some changes here and because i also don't have a good idea of what kind of lighting that i want this actually suits my purpose as well and there was a little bit of a jump cut there but ken actually gave me some feedback when it came to lighting and i decided to implement what he has suggested Having some problems with your internet, Hebron? <laughs> well, hopefully it gets fixed soon, but I, I know how frustrating it can be. And so right now, I'm just trying to establish the, the mood of the image. And one of the big things that I really, really struggle when it comes to creating this kind of mood, the hot and bright kind of lighting is, hmm, how do I put this? But it's, it's really trying to make it convincing. And what I mean by that is getting the value relationships between the light and shadow areas just right, that it feels the way that it should. And I know that's very vague, but to be more specific, some of the problems I have is that sometimes when I, there's the whole principle of if you want to make something look bright, you have to make the shadows darker. But I did not want to go for that concept art look where when people do environments, they have the shadows almost completely black and they separate each layer with almost a fog kind of setting. And that definitely works in some instances, but I feel that if I actually decided to go for that kind of look for this sort of illustration, I think that the mood would just not be quite the same. 
and at this stage i'm just changing the color of the shadow because it wasn't feeling quite right and there's another principle that i've learned as well as to actually paint in light so i've tried to approach the image where i switch in a way like switch off all of the lighting and just paint what the shadow colors would look like first so that's my attempt at trying to simplify the whole process. Hey Vyuki and Evan, good to see you guys in the chat. And no worries, you're not too late. I've only been rambling on for 25 minutes and there's still quite a bit of the process left. So don't worry. I'm just going to take a little bit of a drink here too. So when... Just because I'm showing you guys my process, it doesn't mean that I'm standing on a podium, you know, on a podium or even on a pulpit and preaching down to the masses on what the gospel of proper environment painting is like. Because trust me, I struggled so much with this piece. And at this stage, it felt like I was still stuck in a maze or just trekking through the jungle without any light without any light at the end of the tunnel and at this stage like i said i'm just trying to focus on how things look like in the shadow first before adding in the lighting and making it more complex and i think at this stage that's when i start to introduce the lighting as well but even then at this stage i'm still not satisfied with the colors and here's the problem guys you you know how a lot of artists when you ask them for feedback on how they get their colors right or anatomy correct you'll hear that same answer given back to you all the time to the point that it seems like a cheap cop-out and that answer is just use reference and as as much of a cop-out as that sounds, I do think that it is important. And because I've been preaching that to people for so long, I felt like I, in a way, overcompensated a bit too much by having so much reference. Oh yeah, and Taya says as well, or read James Gurney. Yeah, or I read Alla Prima by Richard Schmidt, which, which I haven't done as well, or go do some studies in real life, but honestly, I'd, pre I'd, I'd really love it if I could actually, you know, go to Greece or a coastal town and do some plein air studies for this piece. But all I had was Pinterest and just my knowledge of Google Foo. But yeah, um, but the problem is, is that I had too many reference images in terms of what the lighting and mood can be. And all of them could work just fine. But because I already had a specific one in my mind, which is a summary kind of vibe, that was the hill that I wanted to die on and nothing else was satisfactory for me. <laughs> and Evan says, go to Anchal. Hey, dude, going to Anchal would be way more expensive for me with where I am compared to actually going to Greece or something like that. And also Latte Milky says, that happened to me when doing personal project. Too many references. Yes. Uh, it's, it's so strange. And that would bring us to a bigger question of how much reference is just the right amount? Or am I, does the reference, or is the reference that I'm using the right one? And honestly, it's hard to say. But I will also say that it's not enough just to have reference and I think what's also important behind the scenes is to understand your reference and what I mean by that is don't just have reference on the side but maybe in your own spare time in between on working on the main illustration itself what you could do is do some studies and I think what that does is allow you to experiment and try and understand something without all of the added pressure of making a finished illustration, adding your own design and trying to apply it to your own lighting scenario on top of trying to understand color and light. So in essence, it's trying to isolate the learning part 
uh, from the actual application part. And I think that can sometimes help if, I mean, assuming that you have the extra time to do so, of course. And the extra practice that I got was actually doing some studio work as well. In the studio right now, I'm doing quite a few environment pieces too. And I've had the chance to try certain things out as well and apply what I've learned back to my personal work. And that kind of fed into each other. So what I learned in my personal work, I've also applied to my studio work. But I think taking off that pressure and dedicating a specific time and not overloading your brain with doing too much can sometimes be a helpful way of learning some things. And that's what I've learned. I've done a lot of composition studies actually for this piece as well ahead of time, like during lunch breaks, during work. I would just take a few pictures from Pinterest and look it up on my phone and just do a couple of sketches in my sketchbook. So just things like that. Because sometimes it feels like if you're using the same limited knowledge all of the time, like you come back to your piece and you still only know as much as you did before, it can become quickly become very frustrating because it's like trying to fit you know, circular peg in a, in a square one. So what I tried to do in my spare time was just shave off a little bit of that, shave off a little bit of that circular peg to make it a square one, if that makes sense. That's a terrible analogy, but hopefully you guys get the point. And the funny thing is as well, because you're doing studies and you're ability to see your problems uh, grow sharper you see me right now actually going back to my piece and making even more changes in the background but now that in hindsight uh, that I'm looking at this piece one of the problems right now is that I'm actually trying to make the shadows too dark and a little bit too colored and that definitely makes it a little bit more difficult for me to control how lighting interacts with it. And I think I'll do a quick example of what I mean by that. So I'm actually going to go back to Photoshop for a while. Create a new layer. So what I mean by that. Come on, Photoshop, don't lag out on me now. There we go. All right, so what I mean by that, let's just say I have this sphere and it's a white, yeah, white colored sphere. That'll do. So the method that I was trying to do before is like a lot of cell shaded art. You'll notice that sometimes, like here, for example, a lot of the shadow color seems to be predominantly one hue. So interpreting that, I make the shadow color one whole hue. So what I mean by that is, or how I try to achieve that is that I use the multiply layer, choose a blue color, and then slap on, and then slap it on and boom, you know, that object is in shadow. And if I want to portray it in a light, in a lit scenario, I will simply, right, give me one, I'll simply unmask it out. Now, simple enough. And that can work, but because of my, of the workflow that I had, is that I actually have another layer on top, which is a curves adjustment layer. And I try to play around with the sliders until I can generate a certain light color that I had. And because I've already made the shadow color blue, it was a lot more difficult for me to try to achieve the results that I wanted. And I realized that this is quite vague guys, but hang in there with me for a while. But what I've learned is that the way that light behaves, or at least this is what 
I've learned uh, from the feedback that Ken gave me is that assuming let's just the reason why that this sphere is in blue right now it would be under the assumption that it is receiving some of that blue lighting from the sky above and that's why you are getting the blue oh sorry wrong brush setting guys you are getting the blue from the top right here however by that logic then it means that this the lower area of the sphere wouldn't be blue as well it would be a different color and because the sunlight is a little bit warmish let's just say it's coming in this direction you're gonna get some bounce light maybe going from here and then somehow it's bouncing onto here and it's also bouncing onto here then you would this area would not actually be blue but maybe it'll look a little bit more like this something like that however mm, you know i could have done it by manually choosing the colors but because i have i was quite specific in how i wanted to do it it just stifled my whole workflow and uh, Vol volcovia comments i guess that would make it easier to make a night scene out of the same environment right well, first of all, welcome to the stream, Volkovia. Good to have you here. And to make it a night scene... Yeah, I think... It, easier or not? Mm, yes, I would say it's easier that way just because it is a more non-destructive workflow. And if I had to manually choose the colors and also have... Because I'm keeping this all on one multiply layer, then I'll have to manually choose the colors and becomes a little bit more of a hassle to change things around which is why i tend to separate each lighting element so the ambient light and also the bounce light and things like that but one thing that i've learned from ken is that assuming that there's absolutely no bounce light or ambient light things are gonna go to black and the example that he showed me was that objects in space where there's no bounce light or anything like that, the shadows are pretty much black. So what was more accurate, what would be more accurate is actually having a sphere that would be more neutral, that goes darker and goes closer to black. But then you have other other light sources interacting with it such as once again the ambient light so you'll only get the top and then the bounce light would be something else which is from the bottom and I guess that's where you will get the core shadow and everything as well because there's going to be a point where the ambient or the bounce light wouldn't interact with it and that definitely solves the problem for me of trying to calculate the color properly with the method that I use so that's a really big thing that I learned is that with no external light, uh, with no light source interacting with the shadow, it would pretty much go to black. But the only reason that it becomes lighter is because of bounce light and ambient light, even though it's in the shadow. So hopefully that's not too much of a mouthful, guys. And I think I need a little bit of time to also formulate a little bit my thoughts about that too. But as you can see right now, I made every part of the shadow pretty much blue because of a faulty understanding of how we get that color. And ambient light in itself is directional too. So if it's from the top, then you're not going to get as much of that from the bottom. Which is why it doesn't quite make as much sense when I start having certain areas uh, being so blue in s despite the ambient light not reaching it however one thing that I did do correct here was introducing warmer bounce light into the shadows just to make it feel like there's a lot of warm lights bouncing around from the sun reflected off of other buildings 
And I think that kind of creates the illusion that it's a packed space and you it gives something for the light to bounce off of. And at this point, I was starting to feel a little bit more happy about the general feel uh, after turning off the line work and seeing things from a squint read or from a distance, things were starting to read a little bit more clearly. So at this point, I was just applying some texture and grime and also just defining the forms a bit. So making circular objects, having smoother, smoother form by using an airbrush and using multiply layer to add in some grime and dirt. So all of the works. And right now I'm also just working on the background too. So as you can see with an image, it's never so linear in terms of what I focus on. I tend to skip around from one part of the image to another. And at this stage, I'm just moving on to the mid ground because I was getting a little bit fatigued and worn out with working on the same area for so long. And if that's how you feel guys, like if you get a little bit bored of working on one aspect of the image, feel free to just move on to another part, honestly, refresh your mind a bit. And at this stage, as you can see, I'm, I've actually started introducing rather vibrant colors to the ship. And later on the image, I've actually decided to tone that down a bit because it ended up feeling a little bit more distracting and the ships looked a little bit too unique and prominent for what it per what its purpose was. And I'm adding small scale objects into the scene as well, such as pop up tents and also crates. And in my opinion, that's actually one of the things that you can do to really sell the believability of space is to create objects which I would call interactives. So something that you know is around human scale. So things like a door, a window, maybe a, a tent, a pop-up tent. And you know, if you're doing a moderate scene like a car, for example. So those are some of the cheap things that you can actually use to indicate scale. And Evan says, refresh mine by starting another work. Yes, if you can do that, then please do so. But unfortunately, sometimes when you're in the studio or you have a tight deadline, we all know that we don't have that luxury. And Hebron also says, yeah, I did the same. Oh, good to hear that, man. And I think it's one of the big things I learned on this piece, actually, is the importance of just taking a break and refreshing your eyes. Because if you've been staring at this at the screen, uh, bit my tongue there, <laughs> staring at the screen for a little bit too long, you'll notice that your eyes just don't quite work the same. Maybe it's just because of prolonged exposure to bright lights and your vision is just starting to go a little bit fuzzy or just fatigue, boredom, whatever it is. It'll get to a point where I think that you're not going to be making very smart decisions. So in the same way that you have that general advice of not making any big decisions when you're fatigued or emotional, I would say it's the same when it comes to art. And I've made the rash decision of making some pretty big changes on this piece when I was frustrated or tired. And... <laughs> Yeah, in hindsight, I would have just given myself a little bit more time to just take a step back from the piece and come back to it with fresher eyes. And what I usually do and what I started doing was just every 25 minutes or so, I would just get up, look outside the window and just do a few stretches. And when I come back, I usually can start seeing like what the most immediate problem is. And I think for a piece that you're in for the long haul, that's really important to do is just having some strategies to help you get through the marathon rather than treating it as a race, you know. And whether I wanted to or not, I actually had to take a day or two break in between because I've been taking 
I've had other obligations outside of art as well. So recently I've been taking up jujitsu classes and I've increased that to twice a week. So I have Tuesdays and Thursdays where I barely can do any personal work. So those are the days where I usually have a little bit of time to just not look at my piece for a while and come back and see that, okay, this is what bothers me the most. This is the biggest fire in the room and this is what I need to address as soon as I can. And when you're deep in the trenches sometime, it's very easy to just want to or to fall into despair and think that everything is on fire and that it's too overwhelming. And you end up making that rash decision of, okay, it means that I suck. It means that this piece is too overwhelming for me and I should just quit. And I've done that before, don't get me wrong. But if there's one thing that I've learned is to not be so judgmental in terms of how you see your art, but rather than you know, making judgments, you know, try to see the problems and find solutions. So rather than a feelings-based approach, try and see it almost like a puzzle of sorts. <laughs> Just gonna read out a few comments in the chat. So Hebron also says, same with your opinion, I guess. Move to another part then came back again later. And yeah, for sure. It's that one is one good way to stay productive and make progress while at the same time having fresh eyes. <laughs> And Evan says, Joe is a fighting chef now. <laughs> and Carda also says, damn, Jordan learning the Joe Jitsu. <laughs> Funnily enough, like when I've been typing Joe Jitsu, because O and I are next to each other on the keyboard, I've accidentally typed Joe Jitsu as well. But it's great, guys. And actually, one of the reasons why I have been a little bit more resilient and also patient with myself with this piece is actually because of the jujitsu lessons that I've been taking. And you might think, hang on, how does martial arts actually transfer over to art? And for me, it's actually being in a situation where I have to learn something and be, and being the weakest person in the room or the most clueless person in the room all over again. A lot of us have felt that way, I'm sure, when we've you know, been at a school environment or maybe even at a workshop when we were starting off in our art where we felt like, ah, oh, I feel like I'm the worst and that there's so many people that are better than me. Uh, and the thing is about jujitsu as well, so actually one of those things that you can't you won't be able to be, let me just pause the video for a while because I might be skipping over some important talking points too. But there's actually certain, it requires a certain amount of time before you actually get good at something. And that reminded me a lot of my learning journey in art. During your fundamentals phase, you're gonna learn so many things that might not even be remotely close to the kind of artwork that you want to create in the future. And there will also be a long period where a lot of the drawings that you're doing from these fundamentals that feel like they're a waste of time. But because I've actually gone through the process with art and the advice that I've given to people is just go through the fundamentals and just be patient. It will all pay off eventually. I've been able to transfer that to jujitsu. But the problem with art is that I tend to get a little bit too judgmental on myself. When I don't get something right, I, I kind of beat myself up over it. You know, not physically, but I tend to be really harsh on myself, um, making you know value judgments such as oh, you know, you're a terrible artist. You know, or you're that maybe I'm not meant to be or that I'll never be able to do it. However, when it came to jujitsu, a lot of people have been very understanding of the fact that, you know, I've, I've been feeling overwhelmed during the lessons or that I've been getting my ass ha handed over to me each lesson. 
And it's because they acknowledge that it takes a while to get there. And as a result, why not enjoy their journey? Be more forgiving on yourself. And just try to, with each lesson, come in with the attitude of, you know, maybe just focus on one thing that you can improve on. And that's not an attitude that I've carried over to my art or had in my approach to art. And I've been trying to implement that recently in the way that I approach my art as well. Rather than making emotional value judgments on myself, I just try to see it as a problem that needed to be solved. And also giving myself the patience and confidence that one day I will actually get to a stage with my artwork that I can look back at at the moment that I struggled and say that I'm glad that I pushed through. And that's something that, yeah, I've learned as well recently is instead of, for example, looking at other people's artwork, because I've had, I would have friends that would also be doing their personal work and succeeding alongside of the time that I'm struggling with this piece. But the one advice that I heard was instead of being jealous or feeling bitter about it, just see those people as inspiration because that is what is humanly capable and the fact that they can do it have that confidence that one day you can also get as good as that or maybe even learning to humble yourself to ask advice directly from those people on how you can improve on those certain aspects and that's what I certainly did so uh, hopefully that little story or experience that I've had would be useful to some of you people in the chat. And right now, I'm actually realizing the importance of just suggestive details. Because uh, earlier on with the piece, I've been trying to be a little bit more literal with the way that I did some of the detailing, where I wanted to make each face of the rock reflect the light more accurately but I realized that that's actually not important and the most important thing is just to have a clear value read and also keeping in mind basic principles such as hard edges and soft edges so I went back to simple solutions of doing just like using a lasso tool and the air and the gradient tool that's been set to a circular mode hey so good to have you in the chat and have I actually, is there a more familiar name that I can attach your username to? Because I don't think I've seen you on the stream before. And Evan also says, I'm kind of too anxious to ask advice from the goats. Well, my question is, what are you anxious about? And I'll actually would love to hear what you, uh, what your response is as well because I have my own uh, idea or response to that as well. But yeah, at this stage, I usually try to keep things a little bit clean. So keeping the shapes clean. And right now I'm trying to make it feel a little bit more natural by adding in some chips and wear and tear to the building. And a lot of the foliage seem a little bit ch too chunked together. So right now I'm just adding in individual leaves and defining little details just to make it feel more natural, I suppose. And one of the feedback, oh, and a big part of why I've been able to finish this piece, yes, is because of the encouragement that I've gotten from my friends. And of course, from Ken, he's been a huge help for me in finishing this illustration. And for example, one of the things that he gave me feedback on was making the shadow shapes more interesting because uh, I'm trying to suggest certain details by having a shadow being cast near the lower half of this building uh, from off screen buildings. But Ken suggested that maybe that shadow can come from foliage actually. And as you can see right now, 
or a while back I was just trying to design the shadow in a more interesting interesting manner oh I see I see ah uh, yes hmm your username does seem a bit more familiar now so forgive me for my spotty memory but but yeah I'm glad to have you join in on the stream and right now I'm just going over a time lapse of an illustration that I've been working on for the previous few episodes uh, of the podcast and that I've been doing in my own spare time as well. So on the topic of suggestion as well, I think I'd, uh, that's something that I struggled with quite a bit with doing the ocean because I really wanted to capture all of the subtle reflections and speculars that are captured in the ocean's waves but i realized that if i did that it might have been a little bit too noisy and in this particular attempt i just tried to really simplify the shapes but still making it convincing enough by having like some of the rocks underneath show up and doing some of the waves too and yes, Yin Harry, I will be uploading the image to ArtStation after the podcast, actually. Just wanted to give a little premiere and exclusive for all of you viewers here today. And just so I can also upload the video <laughs> uh, and post it along with the final artwork so it'll bring a little bit more traffic you know, to the channel. And yes, Taya, I will be in industry workshops with my studio actually um, during September. And if you'll be there, yeah, that'll be an opportunity uh, for us to meet in person. So I'm that'll be really exciting. And I'm still uh, trying to see if I can, if there are any spots left for the demo, I'd like to volunteer myself for that. I think it'll be a really cool experience. Well, I'll be looking forward to meeting you in person, Taya. Oh, and at this stage as well, as you can see, this is where I started to really implement the idea of suggestion. So I just took a textured brush that mimicked the crackliness of pavement and the noise and then I just s s smeared it onto the ground and I would say it does a pretty convincing job of depicting those details and since I've moved on from the foreground to the docks I decided to move on the town that is further back in the background and at this stage as well, because I'm still not sure of the mood that I wanted, I've been doing a lot of like color changes and everything. And one principle that I'm learning is that assuming that it's outdoors and in a daytime scene, usually as things go further back, warmer colors tend not to show through as much, which is why the mountain range in the background is turning into a blue, despite the fact that it's, sim it's supposed to be similar colors to the mountain range that's closer to us and the one that I'm working on right now. And things tend to be a little bit bluer as well due to the atmosphere. So that's something that I think I should have really focused on earlier on. And I think I'm just hopping all around the image right now. Yes, the island was actually one big thing that really bothered me. And in hindsight, one of the reasons why it's looking so strange right now is because it's such a simple island compared to all of the details in the foreground and the midground right now. So in relation to everything, the island looks over overly simplistic and a bit cartoonish actually. And because of that, I, I, I wasn't able to figure out what was wrong. 
and I thought it was the colors and everything. And at this stage as well, because I looked at a different reference image. So I'll pause this quickly and I'll show you specifically. So for example, uh, the image that I was initially looking at was more of this kind of mood. So it's a little bit more sunny with the sun right above you. But then I was also looking at some of the images that Nick Carver has done for Overwatch, which is also a very similar area. But the image was this one where he had done warmer rocks. And that looks good. The whole image looks great. But because I kept changing my art direction, I was still making these big changes even late into the image. Now I'll bring the video back. That small island needs some tower maybe. I think that could have worked, but I did want this island carta to just be uninhabited. Because I think in the game itself, you can sail off to uh, and I certain islands as well. So I wanted all the details there to just be purely nature. And right now I'm adding in some palm trees uh, on the docks. And some crates. So going back to what I said earlier about interactives. And one of the big things that I learned too, such as in the shadow, I was talking a little earlier about how bounce light and ambient light can really affect the values in the shadow. Making it a little bit lighter and a little bit more colorful. But my problem is that I tended to make the bounce light or ambient light a little too strong in the shadow. And as a result, it started making the value ranges in the uh, value ranges of the shadow of and light become a little bit a little bit too muddy. And what I mean by that is let me just quickly pause the video again. So what I mean by that is that let's just say you have a full spectrum of values. So this so you have a full spectrum of values and if you're doing a painting typically you want to allocate a certain range let's just say this much is your shadow and this much would be your light so anything that you're painting in the light should be distinct enough should be distinct enough that none of the values that it's it's clear enough what areas are in shadow and which areas are in light so let's just say for example I'm painting this character however because I made bounce light for example to be too strong I ended up picking some values that are a little bit too close to the light area. And it might seem really obvious right now, but if I blend everything in, you'll notice that the, it becomes a little bit muddy to the point that I can't tell what's in shadow and what's in light. And that's because instead of really separating the shadow range and the light range i made i made the bounce light which is still in the shadow a little bit too close to the light whereas now one of the things that i'm learning is trying to really group those values together to the point that there would be no overlap or very little if any so hopefully that makes sense too this is like the first time that I'm verbalizing some of the things that I've learned. But hopefully that would be useful to some of you people as well. And, and right now I'm also just adding in more 
small scale elements and making the cranes a little bit smaller because they were gigantic before. And right now I'm working on the sea and trying to fill in the area of the of the sea as well because it's looking super empty for some reason and I really couldn't put a finger why. But if I had to really pinpoint why, I do think that it's because the mountains look overly overly simplistic that it doesn't really it feels like it's too sudden of a jump and doesn't hold my attention as much as all of the cool details on the docks, for example. And I'm also using brushes that are a little bit more ripply to suggest uh, the waves on the water as well. And Zoh also says, I'm having hard time managing values, especially the midtones. I always go too dark. Yes. That is definitely something that I really struggle with too. Um, and that's something that I can't really... Um, I guess I can't really explain very well yet. But I think the most important thing is just keeping the relationships between local colors in intact. And... So what I mean by that is that let's just say you have three three colors in the light so that there's three different materials. Let's just say you have a local color that is here and you have a local color that's a bit darker and one that's a bit brighter. You'll notice that there is a certain ratio or there's a ratio between the distance of each color on the value range and when it's in the light area uh, in the shadow area those value relationships should also be maintained so i'm not sure if it compresses i think it might but basically you want it like this and the problem that i sometimes have is that everything in the light area shows really clearly and in the shadow area these value relationships are lost and they sometimes are grouped into one whole value and it's usually v very very dark and as a result it feels a bit muddy or it just loses the mood and earlier on i was also talking about trying to avoid that whole concept rd look of just having the shadows way too dark and i don't think that always has to be the case especially when you have a really brightly lit scene but the most important thing is trying to maintain the the relationships in terms of i guess the distance or the relate or the ratio that it has on the value spectrum but yeah i think if the exposure is in the light then in the shadow it would also be a it would be more narrow as well. Hmm. Yeah, I think I'll have to do a little bit more, give a little bit more thought into this just to make sure that I'm not giving misinformation. But hopefully that does make sense. So I am at this stage just trying to do a little bit of touches to bring this image to a final. So I'm experimenting with adding some fog in between to help with separation. But at this stage, you'll notice that I did a little bit of a hue shift here. And before I actually made the image a little bit too warm because I was distracted by some of the other reference images that I was looking at rather than sticking to the original. Ah, and there we go. Uh, this is the stage where I start adding in smaller details in the background, such as trees. So trying to make it similar to the mountain range that's a bit closer to us. And I think once I did this and even added more layers of bigger mountains in the background, that's when I realized that, okay, now the background somehow <laughs> looks better too. And I'm also designing the clouds a little bit more. 
And you actually notice if you look very closely, the clouds go from white to a little bit warm, almost like reddish off white. And the reason is that because the further something goes back, the more atmosphere it has to go through for the light from that object to bounce into our eyes. And as a result, the more at atmosphere something has to go through, it tends to be a little bit warmer, which is why when the sun falls over the horizon, it grows a lot warmer and redder than when it is up at the top. Hopefully I didn't butcher that scientific explanation, but I think that's what's going on with the clouds too. Some of the clouds that are way further back would turn a little bit warmer and not as white just because it has to travel. The light from that cloud has to travel through much more atmosphere to get to our eyes. And I think that little subtle touch can make a difference. And I'm adding in details on the ship as well. And when people say don't detail too much, I also think that means that you have to at least have a minimum level to make something look convincing. Because before I added those small details on the boat, I think it was starting to look a little bit comical or almost like a toy boat at the docks. And sometimes in adding those details, I'm a little bit more relieved or more confident that this piece will work out. And I think that's something that I'll experiment with a little bit more with my future pieces, which is to work through some of those doubts by detailing, which is a little strange because one of the big feedback that you get from people is that you know not to detail too much. But I think that sometimes it can make the difference between you having the confidence to finish your piece and not. It feels like I'm going against the grain with <laughs> with giving some of the advice that I that I have been throughout this podcast. So as you can see, this is the stage where I'm also trying to bring in all those tiny suggestions of shimmer on the water by using like a really noisy brush that's set to scatter. And I'm moving back to the foreground here and just adding in those small things to bring it to a believable level of finish. So just adding the writing on the signs and the palm trees in the background were looking a little bit too huge. So I made it a little bit smaller too. And of course, now we're at the fun part, which is adding in the characters to bring this whole piece to life. And the approach, you know, because at this stage, I was getting so tired of the piece that as a way of just hmm, getting a faster result, I decided to approach it the way that some animators do, which is making the characters with line work and cell shading rather than fully rendering them. And for those of you that have played the game, you'll notice that I've started drawing a blacksmith into the scene and I figured that the guy that's loitering on the steps could be a rogue as well and man I was just getting so much nostalgic vibes just looking at all of the screenshots of all of the characters and man I'm I'm feeling that pull to go back to playing Ragnarok online again I'm not gonna lie and you'll notice even with my lines too that I'm using that the lines have a jagged quality to it. And that's because I've set my brush tool to a pencil tool and just using a standard hard round. And that gives that crisp kind of look that you wouldn't get from a normal brush because the normal brush uses anti-aliasing, whereas this one doesn't. But unfortunately, because of the low resolution of the image, you're definitely noticing that pixelated look. <laughs> and Evan said, come on, man, let's play again. <laughs> Dude, I wish, but it's getting to that point where I don't feel as much satisfaction when I play games anymore. And I've tried to, to get back into games, but there's still like, that's 
it's not even guilt, but I just don't really get as much of a satisfaction out of it anymore. And I'm also keeping it simple by drawing the eyes almost as slits. And besides, with such low resolution too, it wouldn't matter even if I tried to do a highly detailed eye. But it's been such a long time since I've drawn characters as well, actually. So it was very refreshing just to polish off a little bit of dust with my character drawing. And I'm quite happy with how it turned out and decided to do, of course, the iconic mascot of the game, which is the pouring. So it's that little squishy blob. And in the game, you can actually uh, tame it as a pet. So I think those people that have played the game will appreciate these smaller details a little bit more. Man, Ragnarok Battle Offline is also a really old game. I remember my friends playing it, I think, way back in high school when I was in like 8th or ninth grade. It's crazy. Makes me feel really old when I look back, honestly. And I, I know that there's that mobile phone game version, but no, I haven't touched it yet. I'm not really interested either. So right now I'm just doing the simple uh, color fills as well. Not, not making it too complicated. And I've decided to just slap on a color with with multiply just to hint at the shadows and masking it out and adding a little bit of highlights on the hair just to make it feel a bit more grounded in the environment. And with the people on the docks, I kept it super simple. And if you really scrutinize the image and try and measure all of the figures properly, you'll notice that the scale's way off, but yeah, like I said, that's something I should have addressed way earlier. And I'm just doing finishing touches, such as adding a light bloom. So just setting a pin light layer on top with a blue color. And there we have it, guys. So that's the whole process of the image. And I realized that it went by almost like a blur. So if there's anything you would like me to go back to or even... Explain a little bit more, do let me know. And this is almost like a GIF, a GIF version of a step-by-step, -step, which I'll also be posting up later. But yeah, I'll zoom in a little bit more so you guys can see the finer details. So you have the thief that has just stolen something and just loitering around underneath <laughs> the lamppost. And you have a blacksmith that's looking a little bit displeased at the begging rogue. And little merchant girl that's that's bugging us a rather proud looking swordsman and a magician and an alchemist. So it's, there's these little Easter eggs pretty much throughout the whole image. <laughs> and now that I look, I haven't actually properly detailed out this part. <laughs> it's okay. That can be our little secret. Thanks a lot, Harrison. Really appreciate it, man. And yeah, the little novice here as well with their eggshell hat. And you'll notice that there's a lot of details that are very loose, but I'm learning that with a piece this big, you really have to rely on suggestion. And the most important thing is the squint read or the far away read, because that's pretty much the first impression that people are going to get. And there is some value, in my opinion, of stoking the person's imagination by not spelling everything out literally. And it's a bit more accurate to how we see things in real life too, because things in the distance we're not able to see in full clarity all of the time. So I think it's not only a time saver, but also more faithful to how things are in real life. And this giant coke bottle or rabune bottle of a lighthouse. And just, of course, you gotta have a flock of birds just flying through the air uh, to help <laughs> sell the image a little bit more. 
Overall though, I would say that I'm quite happy with the image. It's something that I was so close to feeling like giving up. I've been going through a lot of self-doubt and just demoralization. Seeing, being, hmm, being so frustrated with my image and seeing my friends at the same time managing to create such uh, create artwork that I thought was a lot better than mine but it's really one of those things like I said that I think having the right mindset can really really help and Hebron asks what next city do you plan to redesign I think we're just going to be doing this one city I'm not planning to do any more in the near future it's time for me to go back to personal projects and Yin Harry also asks do you feel the F foreground lamppost gets kind of lost was that done on purpose because it's in the shadows and a little bit of both uh, I do think that it's fine that it gets a little bit lost and I don't think it's the best placement I'll, I'll admit that but I think from afar as long as these three heads of the lamppost read kind of well I don't think it has to be as clear as the main focal point though because it might end up being a little bit more distracting in the same way where this building feels like some of the values kind of overlap with some of the items in the background however with the main focal point that's when I really decided to make the contrast most apparent so that that's the first read that our eye would go to same goes for the docks you'll notice that there's a lot of neighboring values but it still feels readable enough and of course i'm not saying that there couldn't be a better way of keeping that readability as well but it's an improvement from what i was able to do before so it's a victory in itself for me. It's just one approach, I think. And especially if you look at a lot of real life architecture in real life, not, it's almost impossible for things to feel like everything reads super clearly from one another. And I think what's more important than that is just defining the bigger chunks. So as long as this mountain and the foliage, it separates from this big chunk of architecture, I think it should be fine. And in the same way here, the overall value of the forest, of the trees in the background, as long as it separates itself from this chunk of architecture, it's the most important thing. Because nothing in real life I think it'll be very hard to make everything read very, very distinctly. So I try and think about in big chunks and what I want to emphasize and what I want to de-emphasize. That's my thought process at least. But yeah, I'm not the most experienced when it comes to a full-scale environment painting. So this has been like a small victory for me, honestly. Just seeing this image through and yeah, it's a new milestone for me. And I'm looking forward to seeing how I can apply that to future images. Oof, oh man, that was quite a mouthful. It's always challenging trying to think about what I want to say and in hopes that what I'm saying would be of interest to some people. But hopefully that has been the case for you people in the chat. <laughs> But thanks Harrison. I I'm very I'm very glad that I've finished this image. And Carta asked, why is there no one activating that branch in the city? <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's so many Easter eggs that I wanted to put in. Even like the small chat windows above the characters, like Zenny please kaka. Or things like that. But yeah, I just wanted to keep the clear image read in the end 
But yeah, guys, um, if you have any questions regarding the process or the piece or in general, do let me know because I'm opening up a Q&A session right now. If not, then I'll be moving on to artwork of the week session and we'll be wrapping things up very soon from there. <laughs> not if you're playing on a private server, Karta, because you can just use the the warp master I am glad to hear that Taya and she commented it was definitely one of the best stylized illustration breakdowns I've ever seen thank you glad to hear that and if there's anything that I can improve on do let me know like I realized that I kind of went on tangents in between to show other examples or even just give a little bit of a different anecdote of different unrelated things as well so if you want me to kind of like rewind a bit or just explain certain aspects that i didn't cover as much do let me know but from this piece i'll what i've learned in this piece i'm really excited to apply that to my new uh to my other personal work so here's, I'm going to be showing you guys a little bit of an exclusive sneak peek of some of the personal work that I've done. So some of you have might, might have seen some of these, but in any case, oh, here's one thing that I've done a while back, which is one moment. Photoshop is taking a little bit of time to open up. Just gonna take a sip of water as well. Uh, it's been quite warm actually. For those of you there in UK, I think you know what I'm talking about. That the weather has been extra humid recently. And whew, even though I have no heater or anything on, it feels like it's cooking in here. This is one of the illustrations that I've been working on before I moved on to the Design Jam illustration. It's not that hot, Evan, but you know, <laughs> it's not Jakarta hot, I will tell you that. But maybe a few days ago it was, or even hotter actually. So I've been doing this Octopus Village and it's kind of perfect because I've been working on a piece with a sunnier mood and that's the kind of mood that I want for this piece as well. So I'm really excited to go back here to this piece. So the idea is, I don't know if you guys have seen reference images of like the hotels at the, on the, at the Malda, Maldives or Maldives, don't know how to pronounce it, but uh, they have these really cool networks of hotels joined together. So I had the idea of creating a, a colony of fishermen or tribe of fishermen that pay homage to the octopus. So that'll be reflected in a lot of their design motifs and even the clothes that they wear too. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Evan and Harrison. But it's good to look back actually on this image and realize what I could improve on because I was also feeling a little bit lost at that point too. But sometimes I think that's what we need, guys. It's just that piece where we go through hell just for, you know, a few weeks, but come out the other side feeling like a whole new world has opened up to you in a way. <laughs> um, one, and here's one that many of you would not have seen yet. Um, I'm very excited to go back to as well. So this is another strategy of mine is that usually I start on one illustration and only stick to one illustration. But after finishing it, you're kind of like have in a little bit of a hangover because you've been going through so much stress with that other piece that you kind of want to take a little bit of time to rest and you're in a little bit of a daze, don't know what to do next. But I find that having other pieces on the back burner allows you to kind of just pick it back up without having that downtime of wondering what you want to do next. 
And yes, Taya, I actually got a lot of the lighting for this image from my Modo renders. So this is the clean render. It's a lot spottier, so I ended up just painting over the shadows and simplifying it a lot. But I think one lesson that I've also learned from the Alberta illustration that I've done is definitely trust like 3D lighting a lot more. Um, even though it might seem a little bit strange for me that this shadow isn't as dark, I think that's something that I could try and implement in my own manual color choices too, or at least keep in mind. But yes, uh, the other image that I've done is here. This one shouldn't take as long to open up since it's a much smaller one. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to experiment a bit more soon with a little bit more 3D lighting as well because in the end, I'm kind of obsessed with the whole Overwatch look where it's stylized proportions but also having physically based render so why not just do things straight from 3d renders like ken has been doing with his pieces and they've been really cool and inspirational and i think that has given me that extra bit of courage to try that out again soon and this is the other piece that i've been doing which is a continuation of my food mount series and if you guys are not familiar with that, you can have a look at my art station. But in essence, it's the idea of creating, taking the idea of food trucks and bringing it to a medieval period. So trying to think of medieval solutions or fantasy solutions to it, where you have giant creatures pulling a, a cart or having a stall, food stall on top of their backs. <laughs> well, I'm I'm glad that you appreciate it. <laughs> appreciate that style as well, Harrison. It's just so gorgeous, honestly. Because sometimes I think if I go full stylized or when I see fully stylized art, there's either two things that I can see. Either that person does it because they don't know how to do proper uh, natural lighting. Or second of all, they know it and they get so good that they know how to make informed decisions and stylizations. And I want to be the latter. So right now I'm kind of forcing myself to do things more realistic. And Zo also says, I think everyone has an art face of I want to do Blizzard style. Well, so far I haven't grown out of it. I've been in that phase for quite a while and they've been a big influence on me. Uh, but yeah, back to the piece. So the idea is for this piece, I wanted to do a Mongolian barbecue food truck of sorts. And the idea is that I wanted to make it a vehicle that's like steam powered, but taking influences from the shape of a hot pot. If you guys have seen that before, oh, but instead of making a hot pot, turning it into a grill. So the idea is that you can open up this lid to reveal a grill which you can toss giant slabs of meat on and you have these Mongolian dwarves and giant pitchforks taking the meat and flipping it over and serving it to people. And this is a, a different view of that same concept actually. So I've taken inspiration from Mongolian motifs, locomotives as well, and wagons, and earlier, and horse carriages, horse-drawn carriages. And I actually have to design the creature that's pulling this as well. But, uh, but yeah, um, this is an idea that I'm really excited about. And honestly, I'll, anything to do with food, I get really excited about. <laughs> If I wasn't a concept artist, I would probably be doing something related to food. So art, I mean, food critic, chef, eh, or mukbang channel host, <laughs> any of those things, man. So I decided to just combine two of those passion of mine. Uh, but it really helps to have 3D when it comes to these sorts of designs for sure, especially when it goes to reusability as aspect and yes i did 
paint over 3D in this case because I do want to do it in different views later on, Harrison. So this is the early 3D block out that I had. And I want to do one almost like a Kim jong Gi style where it's almost like looking from the top and then you can see a lot of things surrounding it. So if you can imagine the Mongolian barbecue dwarves just serving up food to the hungry masses. So you have people here on the side with their plates of food as, as, they, as the dwarves serve up freshly barbecued meat to them. Ah, oh, uh, it's just a shame that I had to really put it on the back burner for a couple of weeks. But hey, I'm finished with the Design Jam illustration and I'm gonna come back stronger than ever. So yeah, you guys should hold me accountable. So over the next few months or so, expect uh, more personal work for me because I realized that <laughs> I've been a bit quiet recently. But I think it's getting to a point where I'm more confident and seeing the fruits of my practice kind of pay off, you know. And that's the personal projects that I have in store right now. So there you are, folks. A world first exclusive, <laughs> only on the Drawing Table podcast. So yeah, look out for those. And if you guys have any questions, of course, any other last minute questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to be moving on. I'm going to be moving on to the artwork of the week segment soon. And I'm just going to save out these files and I'll post up the artwork later on as well. So if you guys want to see the, the image in its full HD glory, you can do so later on and support me with that like, of course, let's get it to number one trending boys. <laughs> No worries though. I'm I'm glad to hear that you think so, man. And I'm just gonna close some of my files just so it's not so slow on my Photoshop. And I'll open up my artwork of the week. So the artwork of the week segment is a segment that we do near the end of every podcast where Ken and I, well, if he was here, show artwork that has left an impression of, on us throughout the week. And I've got mine right here. Give me a moment. Just got to navigate through my folders. Hey, it's all right, Karta. I mean, if you want to post it up. Uh, I can quickly feature it on the podcast if you'd like. But I'd love to see what you end up finishing with, man. Those 3D blockouts that you've done so far look really cool. Oh, sorry about that. I don't think I've seen it yet. Ah, there we go. Oh, that's awesome. And let me share this with the with the people in the chat as well. Just give me a moment, guys. Gonna open it up first. So this is the first submission that we've had for Design Jam. So thanks, Carta, for submitting it. So for future design jams, if you guys are interested in participating and having it featured on the podcast or having feedback done in it, uh, then please do join. We're always interested in seeing what other people's interpretations and takes are. Oh, let me make it larger. And here we have an awesome image done by Karta of the town of Morok. So as you guys can probably see, 
Morok is a desert town and I think Carla has done a really nice job of capturing <laughs> capturing the mood of that town and the feel of the architecture including <laughs> the, the smooth and polished naked people and I think it's really cool that he's managed to create you know, a sprawling city from a few pieces that he has duplicated around <laughs> oh, I, I I was just reading a comment by Thea, um, I think in regards to the artwork of the weak image. So we'll get back to that soon. But but yeah, I think you've done an awesome job on it, Carta, so far. And I think once you pump up the lighting, I, I think it'll look really great. I think for these sorts of image, I think it's a perfect opportunity for you to have a lighting scenario where you have since it's maybe late afternoon you can have the light kind of cutting across the top of the architecture and just the top as well so it feels like a dramatic slice of light Yeah, it can be God rays or even just the top as well, actually. So it doesn't have to be the whole thing. So if you even look at it from afar right now, I think it already looks, it looks quite epic. And even just having more atmosphere as well, of course. And one of my favorite layers to use recently is the gradient tool. I don't know why my Photoshop is lagging like crazy recently. If you guys haven't checked out Carta's work as well, uh, be sure to do so. And why don't you do the good people in the chat a favor, Carta, and drop your art station link so that people can appreciate all the other artwork that you've done as well. And he does really gorgeous sci fi and hard surface sketches. So yeah, even just adding atmosphere goes a goes a long way. <sighs> yeah, my Photoshop is lagging like crazy. I have no idea why, guys. And just making the foreground a little bit darker as well. Well, if you have any social media, yeah, sure. Just drop a, drop your Instagram link as well. I think that'll be really cool, man. Maybe I should just purge my Photoshop as well. Can you guys also still hear the music as well, by the way? I'm quite curious. There we go. Just be sure to post up your finished work on illustration there later on, Cartel, when you're done. Do you guys actually like having music on the podcast as well? Because I think it helps fill in the silence a little bit more. Just makes it a little bit more. And hey, Justin, good to see you in the chat, man. Uh-oh, I think my Photoshop has frozen. This is not good. Yeah, my PC is actually quite laggy right now. So, bear with me, guys. I think it's about time that I do get an upgrade on my RAM as well because I've had to take out a lot of my RAM 
slots because some of the slots actually stop working. There we go. Yes. I'll just purge quickly. <laughs> I think I'll have to call that the cooking, the cooking table podcast, Harrison. I think that'll also have to be it for a little bit more of a personal stream because I'm not sure how many people would actually be <laughs> interested <laughs> in seeing me cook. So yeah, as I was saying, adding a little bit of a multiply in the foreground, I think helps a lot too. But yeah, with that simple lighting adjustment, I think it makes all the difference, Karda. So just adding some atmosphere, some light just cutting across the top and gradient, multiply gradient as well at the bottom. I think it does the trick. But yeah, keep it up, man. I think it's going to be a really, really cool image. And do let us know when you finish. And we can feature it as well. All right. So back to the artwork of the week segment. And um, and Taya actually made a comment on this piece as well by Tooth Wu where she says that it reminds her of the video where a girl tried to eat a living octopus and chewed off her face. I saw that too and it, oh man. I don't even know why she was trying to swallow that octopus whole honestly. Seemed like the worst idea or just a way to just choke yourself to death. It's a live octopus too. Oh yeah, I mean, Taya did mention that. But in any case, Tooth Wu has actually been one of the artists that I really looked up to for quite a while. And I think it's for a couple of reasons. And as you can see, his rendering skills are unreal. He's able to capture so many subtleties of material without feeling so overly done. There's still that stylized, clean stylized look to it. And... The designs that he creates also usually feel so... I think they're, they're really strong as well. Because I think one of the things, if I have to be honest with a lot of Chinese artists, is that their designs tend to be a little bit more recycled from other media that they have seen. But I think Tu Thu has a unique design sense in comparison to all of it. And... Yeah, that's one of the reasons why I really like this image so much. And the drama that is being captured, just the look of terror and panic on the person's face. And the design of the creature as well. It's so simple, but even the way that the material is rendered just makes it feel like alive. So yeah, that is the first artwork and with the second one, oh, of course, please follow him on ArtStation under the profile name Tooth and you can also look up Tooth Wu as well. And the other image is by Matthew McHugh, if that's how you pronounce his name. And oh, I'm a big sucker for Blizzard's artwork. And one thing I really like about this image is the moods. And in general, I think Matthew is really great at rendering stuff. And I think you'll notice a common pattern here where I tend to admire people that are able to do well, uh, accurately rendered materials and lighting, but maintaining a stylized proportion and feel to it. And the lighting on this piece is really gorgeous as well. And because of what I've been learning as well with my own experiences, I really love the value groupings. It's so simple, yet so readable. And yeah, he handles the relationships between the values really well. And without having to resort to that, like I said, that concept arty look where everything in the shadow is so dark. <laughs> I 
Uh, and that wraps up the artwork of the week segment and actually the whole podcast, guys. If you would believe it, it's been around two hours. Wait, no, not two hours. One hour and 50 minutes already since the start of the podcast. And it's been a little bit of a slow start, I'll admit, because it's just one of those days where if I haven't really been talking to too many people throughout the day, it takes a while for my brain to start up. But I really appreciate you guys dropping by. And there's some faces here as well that, you know, are not usually here, but they managed to finally catch the podcast. So I really do appreciate that. So people like Yin Harry and Zaw, you know, Hebron. And yes, you've unfortunately missed the juicy part of the live stream, Justin, which is the commentary over the final illustration of that I've done for Design Jam. But I will be posting up the artwork and of course the whole episode of the podcast on YouTube and including the previous episodes as well. Uh, we realized that we've been a little bit inactive when it comes to updating you guys about what we've been up to. And yeah, we've just been really busy, much more so than usual. But we're going to make some adjustments, guys. Because some other things have came up. But I do think that it's our responsibility to just make some adjustments to our own schedule. In order to continue bringing you guys content and making it better with each one as well. <laughs> and Yin Harry also said... No, the podcast isn't over yet. Jordan's about to share food. I am actually going to be making some sushi after this. So I might just put it up on my Instagram later on too. But yeah, um, I, I really do appreciate you guys sticking around. And of course, if you guys enjoyed this episode, you can follow us on our social media links as well. So you can follow us on our Instagram and facebook for updates and announcements oops <laughs> i forgot to change the social media link and it's changed to some of the previous guests that we've had but you can catch us on youtube as well to watch previous episodes and of course subscribe to us on twitch for updates on future episodes and to catch us live as well and yeah thanks for attending xylin and for everyone else that has joined as well and of course, we also have a Facebook group as well that you can join where you can post your own artwork for design jams or even submit pieces to for future sessions such as feedback, which I will post up in the chat. There we go. <laughs> All right, well, I hope you guys have a great rest of the day. And once again, without sounding like a broken record, thank you so much for joining us, guys. And we do have some new episodes cooked, cooked up or at least on the stove right now. So we hope to see you guys on future episodes. All right, take care, everyone. I'll see you next time. <laughs>